Mate, great to have you on the show. I've got to get your take on this uh, Malcolm Turnbull. I mean, it's a kiss of death for O'Connell. And Barilaro didn't miss saying their former PM's got to quit or the Liberal Party's got to get some ticker and sack him. Malcolm Turnbull fired back on Twitter late this afternoon, labelling Barilaro a joke. You know Hunter, you know Cole. How's this all going to play out? Well, you can put a pen through her. That's the kiss of death without any question at all. Uh, look, he needs to resign. I mean, it's very obvious that Malcolm Turnbull is in a stage rehearsal at the moment to one day be uh, leader of the Labor Party. I mean, the guy has done a complete 360 when it comes to his policies. He's out there, you know, uh, pontificating about climate change and trying to shut down coal-fired power stations. And, of course, uh, it's the hunter. It's the home of coal-fired power stations in this country. It's been built off a hundred years of coal mining in that part of the world. I think uh, I think Gladys is being a little bit. She's probably exaggerating a little bit, suggesting a miracle. Because I firmly believe that uh, the coalition will hold uh, Hunter or Upper Hunter uh, on Saturday, mm. off the back of the way in which the New South Wales government has handled, um, both from a fiscal and a health perspective. The, uh, the coronavirus pandemic. I mean, you compare what New South Wales has done with what's happened in Victoria. You compare what's happened today with the Victorian budget and the high-taxing mm -hmm. Victorian budget. And Jennifer Westacott came out earlier today and said, you know, why can't uh, Victoria reward aspiration and growth just like New South Wales does? So mm -hmm. I think Gladys is probably playing it down a bit, uh, but I do think the coalition will be returned on Saturday. Well, let's, uh, let, let's see if everyone wants uh, underdog status going into a poll. That's not unusual. I'm going to talk to some locals on the ground in The Hunter a little later in the show and get their take on that. Uh, let's go to another issue here. Christian Porter, his legal team scrambling to ensure the high-profile barrister representing him, Sue Krizanthu, is allowed to stay in the action in this defamation suit against the ABC and Louise Milligan. There was an 11th hour push, a legal action from a woman called Jo Dyer, a friend of the woman who accused the former Attorney General of sexual assault to bar Chrysantho from representing Porter after she allegedly had access to confidential information from Dyer. Now, Porter's lawyers say it would be a very big deal for Chrysantho mm. to be barred from acting for him, from being his barrister, because of all the costs already incurred and all the substantial delays that would come of it. This is getting to be very, very high stakes, uh, is my sense yeah. of it, legally. What's your take, Lisa? Yeah, you took the words right out of my mouth. It is high stakes. It would be a very big deal if Sue Chrysantho was unable to be part of Christian Porter's team because... Let's be really frank here. She is one of the top defamation lawyers in the country. She represented Geoffrey Rush uh, in uh, Rush's uh, uh, defamation case against the News Corp papers, and uh, she's a winner. And, uh, you know, uh, I mean, you're mm. a lawyer, Peter. You know what it's like uh, to be there in the cut and thrust of trying to win a high-profile defamation case. It is high stakes, and she would be a massive loss mm. to the uh, Porter team. So you can understand why they are so very, very keen to ensure she remains part of it. Of course, it's up to the judge, uh, you know, the ins and outs of whether she did the wrong thing, whether she breached uh, confidentiality between clients. So that's a matter for the judge. But I tell you what, if she is disbarred from actually being part of this case, it will make life a lot more difficult for Christian Porter going forward. Yeah, it'll be an early win to the ABC. I, I want to go to this issue that's come up in relation to Qantas Pilot, and, and it fits in this broader debate of why get vaccinated right now when we haven't got immediate threats. A whole lot of Qantas pilots are up in arms. They've been doing the repatriation mm. flights uh, between other countries and Australia. They're all fully vaccinated, but they're spending weeks and weeks quarantining. Uh, the Australian and International Pilots Association say some pilots have gone six weeks without seeing their family because of all the quarantine rules. Now, if people work in hotel quarantine, they're allowed to go home. If people work in hospitals, if they're vaccinated, they're allowed to go home. Mm. I can't understand why the pilots have to be basically locked up and away from people. They've all been vaccinated. It, what's the point of the jab if you're going to be treated mm. the same as people who haven't had it when you've had it? Isn't that the whole point? 
Exactly. I think it's inhumane. I mean, you know, to, to subject these pilots to being away from their family for so long. They're already copped a raw deal. Most of them have lost their jobs because of the pandemic. You know, we've had reports here in Queensland of pilots actually out in Bowen picking fruit. I mean, they're the ones who get out there and actually have a go. Uh, you know, they are highly skilled, highly qualified, and, you know, it's a passion for them, it's a job for them. And now they're being subjected to mm. these particular rules, which I think, frankly, Peter, are unfair. And I think that then it's a loophole. They need to be able to once, you know, because they're vaccinated and because they're protected, uh, they need to be able to go home to their families. I think it's inhumane. And I don't know whether it's Greg Hunt's call or, or whether it's, um, you, you know, um, uh, the Prime Minister's call, but someone needs to intervene and uh, get these guys back with their families. I just think it's terrible. Yeah, look, and undermines the whole point of vaccination. I, I want to head up your way. <laughs> Only a local can explain this for me, please. A Gold Coast hair salon, the owners banned customers who've had, who have had the COVID vaccine from going in the store. Let's have a listen. I hope this inspires others to lead fearlessly and be able to make choices and decisions within their business that feels aligned to who they are as individuals. So, so, so not those who haven't been vaccinated. This is those who have been vaccinated. New poll from Queensland uh, Health Department 2 says 40% of those up your way are reluctant to get the jab. I'll say it again. I say it most nights here. If government gave people their choice of vaccination, Pfizer or AstraZeneca, I reckon half the problem would be solved. Gleeson, help me explain uh, this woman on the Goldie. Well... Clearly, uh, this is madness. Uh, I mean, and, and it's surely it's discriminatory. I mean, I don't, I don't know who can enforce uh, the law here because, you know, this woman... Now, she's got form, this woman. She's into some sort of shamanic uh, rituals or shamanic rituals and they go into a trance. I think she is in a trance right now. I think she needs to somehow have a look at trying to get out of that trance because this is the most ridiculous thing. I, we hear a lot of ridiculous things here in Queensland, Peter, but that's the ridiculous quote of the week, stopping people. And what it does is it undermines the entire process. It undermines the entire vaccination mm. process because people say, oh, well, if a hairdresser is saying this, surely there's got to be legs in the fact that we shouldn't be uh, getting vaccinated. And it just gives the anti-vaxxers more and more and more ammunition. You're right. We need some sort of circuit breaker here. I don't know what it is, but we need more and more people vaccinated because right now, what was that figure the other day on the front of the SMH? 29% of Australians say they won't get vaccinated. That's extraordinary. Vaccine choice. Vaccine choice. I tell you, it will do it. You don't need to give people, you know, Tetzlato vouchers or beer or all the other stuff that's been thrown around. Just let them decide what goes in their arm and they'll get vaccinated. Let, let's go to this proposal out of Victoria, because you think Queensland's crazy. It's plenty of crazy down here in Melbourne. The Health and Community Services Union's pushing the Andrews government to legalise recreational personal use of cannabis. But they're not stopping there. The union, which represents 10,000 or so workers in the state, wants the government to grow the cannabis and sell its own branded cannabis and use the profits to fund frontline services. So I guess they're creating themselves a market, aren't they? These are health workers. We know that mm. there's cannabis linked to schizophrenia and all sorts of mental issues with young people. Maybe they're worried that with all this mental health money, they, they will lose their... That you lose their patient base. Maybe cannabis is a way to get them back. I, I know the Andrews government's got a revenue problem, but this is a bridge too far, Gleeson. Mm. Well, we've just been talking about people being in a trance. Uh, I think that might apply here. Uh, maybe you need to be high to live in Victoria. I don't know. I mean, I love visiting Melbourne. I think it's a wonderful place. Uh, but I couldn't, certainly couldn't live there. And I tell you what, I've never met so many people in the last six weeks who have, uh, who have actually come up from uh, Victoria and emigrated to South East Queensland because they can't stand what's going on there. Look, this is, again, um, just one of those uh, fanciful uh, conquests by the union movement. I mean, good luck to them for at least being a little bit innovative. I mean, most of the profits will go to the Andrews government to be re-elected anyway, so it's this sort of... It's like a Ponzi scheme, isn't it?